Good morning, Litchfield. Good morning. Hey, we're so happy to see you here today. We welcome you to our services, but uh, I tell you what, I, I, I still feel like I'm having a hangover from last night's uh, 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 service. Anyhow, today we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about the need for Christmas. And lucky for you, I, I have perfect vision. I can see your need. I can see the fact that some of you, some of you are living with an 800 pound gorilla <laughs> and, and it, it, it's a real distraction, a, 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 a real distraction. But lucky for you, that's why I'm here. As a preacher, I, I can see everybody else's needs. I don't have any needs. I don't live with an 800 pound gorilla. I don't live in the darkness. But, uh, but you guys do. And uh, uh, anyway, as I was saying, <clears throat> it's a good thing that I'm here today because I have perfect vision of all, of all your needs. Are we playing basketball or am I preaching here? Uh, I asked my 800-pound gorilla to come and illustrate an important truth today. How many of you know who this gorilla is? <laughs> it looks just like him, doesn't it? Yeah. Take your... <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Gus. Yeah. Please, please be seated. All right, thank you. I had been in that gorilla outfit. You remember, I don't know, three, four years ago, I did a series of sermons on living with an 800-pound gorilla in the room. And uh, he came in, you know, and uh, everybody tried to guess who he was, you know. And uh, we had a lot of fun with it. And I called him up this week and I said, Ben, we just need to do that 800 pound gorilla one more time. Because as we kick off these messages today, beginning with a new series on Christmas, I want to begin by talking about the need for, for Christmas. And I want you to be thinking about how you look at Christmas. What's your view of Christmas? Where are you? How are you feeling this Christmas season? Are you looking forward to it? Do you say, I really need Christmas this year? Or are you saying, I just wish it would never come. I'd just be glad when it's all over. How do you feel? Maybe you feel like uh, Chippy the, the parakeet that Max Lucado talks about. Chippy the parakeet was sitting in his cage one day peaceful, happy, singing his songs on his perch. The next moment, his life is turned upside down because his owner, after vacuuming the house, took off the attachment at the end of the hose, stuck the hose in the cage to clean out the cage when the phone rang and she picked up the phone just as she saw, shoo, there went Chippy the parakeet, sucked up into the vacuum. She immediately hung up and turned off the vacuum, opened it up, pulled out the <laughs> uh, dust container, and there was Chippy, still alive, but covered with dust and dirt and soot. And she immediately took him over to her bathroom faucet and turned on the water, and of course it's not warm yet, it's, hot, it's cold, to wash him off and clean him up. Now he's going into shock and he's shivering and she immediately grabs her hair dryer, turns it on high to, to dry him off. A few days later, the reporter that first told this story on, on the air called the owner and said, I want to do a follow-up. How's Chippy, the parakeet, doing? She said, well, all I can say is he's alive. 
She said he doesn't sing anymore. He just sits on his perch and stares. <laughs> well, maybe that's where you're at this Christmas season. Maybe you feel like that. Sucked up, washed out, blown away. It, 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 is that you? This, this Christmas? And you say, I just don't feel like Christmas. Perhaps. But, but if it is, I, I've got good news for you. You need Christmas more than ever when you think you don't need Christmas. Others of you, you're just saying, man, I'm just bored with the, the thought of Christmas. You know, same old thing, same old materialistic uh, stuff everywhere. You know, we don't even see the real meaning of it. And, and so we're turned off by it. Well, I did some research this last few weeks. You think you're bored with Christmas? Does anyone here have any, any idea how many sermons I have preached on Christmas through the years? I figured up, went through my files, and I have preached nearly in the last 45 years, being in a located ministry at Nebo 5 at Nebo 40 here. I have preached nearly 200 sermons on Christmas. Whoa. That's like preaching on Christmas every Sunday for four years straight. Can you imagine? The good news is I've never repeated any of them. Uh, <laughs> now, if you believe that, I got some swamp land I want to sell you after church. You know. But 200 sermons. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, what more can I say? I feel like the two ladies had talked all afternoon over the backyard fence, and finally one of them said, I got to go. I've already told you more than I know. So sometimes that's where we're at, isn't it? You know, we, we've just heard so much. And here's my fear. Some of you are not tuned in, and you don't see just how much you really need Christmas. Maybe these pictures depict where you're at this morning with, with Christmas. Yeah, maybe I like Clinton there. You know, just, you say, man, I don't need this. I don't need these Christmas messages. You just want to sleep through it all. Or maybe you feel like with all the hassle of it, here's Santa who has crashed in, in, in the tree. I, I, I'm sure that's a staged photo, but, but maybe it's more reality for you than, than, than you realize. But then we have one more picture of two of our grandkids a few years ago. Beth and Luke thought they would take them to see Santa Claus, and that would make them happy. But there are days not even Santa Claus can make two girls happy. You know, you remember those days, girls? Uh, so I don't know where you're at this Christmas season. But I want to tell you, there is a real need for Christmas. And when you think of Christmas and all the gifts that will be bought and given and exchanged and opened, let's just simplify it, okay? Here it is today. There's just two. Two categories of gifts really you're going to find under the tree about eight times a year. Only two gifts at Christmas, those that we need and those that we want. Isn't that true? I mean, that's pretty much it. It's what you need or it's what you want. Here's the problem. What we <laughs> want, we really don't need. And what we desperately need, we usually, we usually don't want it. Don't want it. So, where are you at Christmas? You know, I had Ben come out at the beginning here to, to show some of you are in the darkness. Some of you have an 800-pound gorilla you're living with. And, and you're in denial. You can't see it. And we hope that's the message of Christmas. It turns on the light. Here's our scripture for today. Uh, it's from Isaiah 3 and then some from 5. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord. He looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness but heard cries of distress. Those are tough times. But let me tell you today, these are tough times as well. 
You can't turn on the news any day, but what you hear a public figure, everybody from uh, Bill Cosby to Matt Lauer to Charlie Rose, the beat goes on and on and on, whether you're talking about sports, whether you're talking about politics, whether you're talking about senators, whether you're talking uh, about news anchor men and women. Just incredible, incredible, horrible news. Talk about living in the darkness. Just in this past fall, just in the last couple of months, two, three months, we have seen unbelievable acts of violence upon innocent people from the Las Vegas shooting in which over 500 people were wounded and over 50 killed. Uh, just unbelievable, attending a country western concert. And then it was only to be followed up by a small church in Texas of about 50 people and they lost half their people just gunned down while worshiping. We need Christmas. We need the light to come on because we are so lost in our darkness. Here's what Isaiah prophesies in chapter 9, verse 2, though. The people walking in darkness, they've seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. That's my prayer for you today. Some of you are living in the darkness. You need the light of Christmas. And that's what Christmas is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about every week from now through uh, Christmas Eve. Here we go today. There's just a couple of things. We didn't put any outline in the bulletin. We want you to just take this home with you uh, and, and think about it. I want to make it easy for you on this sermon. But here there are. There's just a couple of thoughts we're going to leave with you today. Here's the first one. The hardest thing in the world, and this was already illustrated by the 800-pound gorilla, wasn't it? How hard it is seeing how great our need is because of the darkness of our sin. Our need is just so great. And like I said at the introduction, it's easy for me to see, boy, those, those people, they're lost. They're in the darkness. They need this. They need to be better parents. They need to manage their kids well. They, they need to make them behave. They need to get a job. Uh, that guy needs uh, to work harder. Uh, we go on and on. I can see everything wrong with everybody else, but like the 800-pound gorilla up here, I just can't see. I just can't see my own. It's the hardest thing in the world. Here's some scriptures that we want to talk about from, from Romans. And it sums up the first two chapters of Romans where it says, you know, the Gentile had knowledge of God through creation, but they, they were lost in their sin. Uh, the Jew in chapter 2 had knowledge of God through the law, but they rejected it, and, the, and they were lost and in the darkness because of their sin. And sums it up in chapter 3. It says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. Boy, that's a lot of people today. They are so much in the dark, they have absolutely no fear of God when they, they should be afraid. This weekend is deer season, isn't it? Yeah. A deer hunting. I remember one of the first years I took our son Andy deer hunting. He wanted to go deer hunting, and I said, okay, I'll take you. And so we got our license, and we got our tags, and we got our orange uh, colors, and we got everything uh, that you could possibly have to be legal. And I picked him up from school on a Friday afternoon, and he says, Dad, can we go down and set up our deer stands. They were the climbing deer stands, you know, where you pump bomb the tree and you climb up the tree, you know, with that, with that stand, work your way up. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. So we went down there. I did mine, went up the tree, came down. Andy was 
doing his. He was up and down the tree, up the tree. And I, I, I was down there, standing by our pickup truck. We'd driven down through our field and just standing there by the creek. And I actually was watching a couple of beavers that were swimming and working in the creek and, and watching them from a distance, just waiting for Andy to come down for us to go home. When all of a sudden, I see this vehicle come off the road and come across the field at a high rate of speed, just bounce. And I could see it was the game warden. And I thought, <laughs> I got nothing to be afraid of. I'm in good shape. I got news for that guy. Well, he came flying up there. He comes out of his truck and he grabs my gun and he looks and he goes, it's loaded. I go, so? I said, it's kind of hard to kill a deer with an empty gun. And uh, he goes, it's past ours. And then I began to get afraid. <laughs> like, what do you mean it's past ours? It's 445. Well, yeah, it's still daylight. Well, yeah, it quit at, I think, like 440. Five minutes. I said, well, I'm not hunting. He said, oh, is that your stand over there on the ground by that tree? I said, yeah, I was just coming to get it set up, you know. And all the while I'm thinking, oh, man, Andy's up in the tree. <laughs> and uh, he just keeps talking. And I said, I was watching some beavers in the creek. I'm just standing here by my truck. He opens the truck. He goes, where's your gun case? I said, it's up the house. He said, well, you're going to get a ticket for that, too. I go, well, well wait a minute. You see the tracks through the field. I didn't go out on the road. This is my property. I bought it. I paid taxes on it. I said, well, you, if you put it in the vehicle, you've got to have it in the case. Man, I'm getting even more afraid now. I go, oh, my. You know, I just can't believe it. All the while, while I'm talking with him, across the creek, guess what? Bang, 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 bang. You know. And, and I kind of had it. I looked at him and I said, let me tell you something. I said, I'm a preacher. I try to do what's right. I thought I was legal, had nothing to be afraid of. You're telling me I've got a lot to be afraid of. I said, I got a feeling if you go across the creek and start arresting those guys, you might have something to be afraid of yourself. They might find you at the bottom of the creek. I said, but you know you can get away with it with me. And so I should have mouthed off to him like that. So he said, sit down, come in the vehicle. So I sat down and he starts to, he said, uh, I'm just going to give you a warning for one. I thought, great. He said, I'm going to give you a ticket for the other. And I thought, oh, man. And all the while, I'm thinking, Andy, Andy, oh, Andy, you know. And he just keeps talking, and it's getting dark and dark. And I think, oh, man, he's just, Andy was even harder, I think, in junior high. And I'm thinking, he's going to come down and say, what's going on? Who's this? I don't know that kid, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's not mine. And, uh, you, you know, I just, I just prayed. And uh, so I got a ticket, and, and he left. The moment he left, I walked over to the tree where Andy was, and Andy came down, and I said, did you hear that? He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, uh, what were you doing? He said, I did what the Bible tells us to do. I was like Adam. I hid myself. I scooted around the backside of the tree so he couldn't see me, you know. And I said, I'm glad I taught you well, you know. So. I didn't think I deserved any ticket. But he pointed out to me, the game warden did, that I was more in the dark than I, 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 I realized. And later... I was really upset, I won't go into the details, but I was really upset that all the, all the arrests he made that season, he always makes a lot. My name got on the front page, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I called his office when he told me it wouldn't happen and, uh, you know, uh, had some choice of words and, and he came by one day to my family and apologized. Well, he should have because I realized I was allowed five minutes, but when he rolled up, he, he rode up for a half hour later. He had me hunting at 5 o'clock at night and when it was total dark. And, 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 but since then, we've, we've mended fences and uh, simply because my boss said I had to. But uh, we mended fences. But, man, I, I thought I was pretty good. 
Those are sometimes the hardest people to see the light. Some of you are thinking, don't need Christmas, don't need the light. Man, man, we're doing good. We're doing good. No fear of God. Proverbs says that's the beginning of getting smart, beginning of wisdom. Okay, let's quickly move on today. Just two thoughts I'm leaving. Here's the second one. We see our need is so great because we're in darkness and we can't see it but because of our sin. But here it is. The second most important, secondly, the most important thing in the world is for us just to humbly, humbly admit our need for Jesus to save us. Man, that's, that's our need. That's our need. But it takes a lot of humility to say, man, I don't have my act together. I do have an 800-pound gorilla in my life. I am in the darkness. I do need help. I can't solve my own problems. I can't control my addiction. I can't control my temper. I can't control... Uh, my life's out of control. Man, you need... You need Jesus. Let's put that picture up at this time if we can. How many of you know who that is? How come are only old, old people raising their hands? And no offense to you raising your hands. Who is it? Ralph Edwards of the old TV show, This Is Your Life. That TV show aired on radio from 1948 to 1952. And in 1952, the year that I was born, it went on television for the first time time. Now, I don't remember a lot of the episodes that first year, but uh, it would stay on television until the early 60s. And I do re vaguely remember my mom and dad just watching that show, This Is Your Life. He would come out with that big red book of his, and he would open it up, and he would begin to narrate a life story. A biography, if you would, of an individual. And throughout, there would be guest appearances that would surprise that person that they hadn't seen in, in years or decades. But they were people that were very powerful and influential in writing and maybe even changing a life story. You know, ultimately, that's pretty much what our lives are about. And, you know, we're closing out the biggest chapter of our life, obviously. But it's hopefully not the end of our life story yet. But this chapter for the last 40 plus years exists in Sammy's and my life because we saw a need to try and help turn on the light to people we love that were lost in the darkness. But that big red book isn't nearly as important as another book that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. <coughs> Revelation 20, we read these words. I saw the dead, great and small, those who were powerful and Influential and somebody in life, millionaires, billionaires, polit famous people, and those who nobody knew, nobody cared about, nobody ever noticed. The great, the small. I saw the dead. He sees them all. Standing before the throne. It seems like pretty much the ground's pretty much level after death, isn't it? That there's only going to be one thing that really matters as we read about. And the books were opened. You can't find these in a church. You can't find these in a library. You can't find it on a television show. You won't find it in Ralph Edwards' books that he left behind of This Is Your Life. But the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. And that's the book in God's hands. And if anyone's name was not found written in the Book of Life, was thrown into the lake of, of fire. 
You know, it's all about a life story. My life story of being your lead minister for the last 40 years has only been and coming into existence because I want to change some life stories in this community. That names that had not been in the book of life would now find themselves in the book of life. You know, just recently, we lost a very dear, beloved, faithful member of this church, Chick Bishop. I remember Mark York telling me one day, years ago, he said, Steve, a friend of mine Chick, named Chick Bishop is in the hospital. Would you go make a call on him? You remember asking me to do that? I said, I'd be glad to. And so I did. I went and introduced myself, had prayer with him. And later they began coming to church, not just because of that. There was a lot of influences in their life. And his granddaughter Maria would probably have the biggest influence of all. And I remember one day he called up and he says, can I come into your office, Steve, and, and talk with you? I said, absolutely, Chick. So he came in and he sat down across my desk. And he had a Bible and he laid it on my desk. Big desk I have. And he said, Steve, I want you to shoot straight with me. I want to know that I can get, be right with God. I, I, I thought I had been all my life. I want you to open that book and show to me what God's word is for my life and my will and what he would have me to do. You know, my granddaughter says I need to be baptized. I want, I want to know what God's word has to say. Here was a guy that's been an educator his whole life. Brilliant guy. I mean, his resume just doesn't stop. And so I began taking him from scripture to scripture to scripture. And I said, we'd read it. I said, do you understand that? What's it say to you? What's God saying to you? And then when we got done, he says, I want to be baptized. And one chick bishop, you know, man, they just make it all worthwhile. I remember another one. One day, Lucille Diamond, and I knew her from the church of Washville when I was a kid growing up, but she now attended here. She said, Steve, my brother Lloyd has had an accident. He's in really bad shape. They don't think he's going to live. He's in the hospital at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. He wants to see you. Will you go talk to him? I go, ha, ha, yeah, he wants to see me. I knew Lloyd sat off. Lloyd had no use for the church. He would not give any preacher the time of day. I'd heard stories of preachers and evangelists through the years making calls. They never got in the door. They got sent on their way pack and, and fast. I go, right, he wants to see me and talk to me. Sure, yep, I'll do it. I wasn't looking forward to it. I'll be honest, I didn't have a really great attitude. I wonder where this one's going. And... Uh, I get there and I walk in the room and I see one of the most awful sights I've ever seen. He's in a bed and I've never seen more tubes and everything going every which way in his mouth. And he's everywhere, all part. I didn't know you could have that many tubes. And I saw he is truly in bad shape. But he was responsive. And he lit up when I came in and I said, hey, I'm Steve. You know, Lucille asked me to come and said, you want to talk to me? And he, he, he couldn't move, but tried to, and so I took his hand, and he began to squeeze it like it's never been squeezed. And then he took a pad, a notepad, and a pencil in his hand like this. Not like this, because he couldn't do it. And he began to write, and I'll never forget it. I, I go, need, need, be b baptized. And he got halfway through it, and I finished it for him. He nodded his head. I go, we got a problem, Lloyd. 
I don't think they're going to let me take you out and, and dunk you, man. I, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, whoa, this guy, they wouldn't let me sprinkle him or pour. You know, I said, Lloyd, I'm glad you realized that, but right now that's just not possible. But let me just tell you about Jesus, okay? I'm going to take you as far as I can today. And so I began to talk, and uh, when I got done, I said, let's pray, and I took his hand again, and, and, and we prayed. And I prayed that God would give him the opportunity to be baptized. And I knew it was a long shot <laughs> at best, you know. I thought, this just ain't going to happen. But as I got ready to leave, he grabbed that pad again, and he said, T-H-A. It's okay, Lloyd. You're thanking me for coming. ISIS, I, I'm, I'm glad to come, seriously. It's been good for me. And I'll never forget, he start, last words he'd write that day. P-L-E, please, please, you want me to come back? I said, I promise you. I won't be here every day, but I'll be here every week. You will see me. And I left, and I began praying from those days on, saying, God, <laughs> this guy... I think he's the real deal, but you know it better than I do. But, man, I don't think he'll never be able to be baptized, but he's really wanting to turn, the light has turned on for him. I asked Tommy, his, his son here today, faithful, a faithful member here, just never misses. And uh, I said, how old was your dad when this happened? And I think he said 79. 79 years old. Hardened, lived in the darkness, wanted to stay in the darkness. But God turned on the light. Well, make a long story short. The weeks went by. He gradually, and I say gradually, got better. He got out of the hospital in a wheelchair, still, still not doing well. I mean, you know, from the accident. Then they found out he had other health issues. I mean, I thought, man, he's still not going to be a candidate for, for baptism. And he called me up one day. But he was coming to church every Sunday. They'd wheel him in here. His daughter Annette would bring him and her health. She died shortly after he did. She was in bad shape. And they'd come in the old pickup truck. We'd help him out, help him in. And he'd hang on every word. And one week he called me up and he said, Doctor said I can be baptized. And I want to do it now. I go, okay, man, if they gave you... You know, permission, that, that's awesome. Let's do it. So it was during the week he came here. And we helped him into the baptistry room. And we said, now, now, we, we have a stool in there for you. Uh, and uh, both of us, Paul and I, will baptize you. And uh, because of your situation, and, and we'll help you in. But we got to go get somebody to take some pictures or we're going actually uh, video recorded so we go to get that when we come back Lloyd isn't in the baptistry room he has crawled up the steps by himself and he has crawled down into the water himself and he's in on the stool and uh, he's ready to go and, and and we baptized him and after that he never missed a Sunday for almost the next two years he was the real deal. Now, here's the rest of the story. His son, Tommy, here today, he wasn't going to church. And when his dad first said that, he says, it's, it's a phony. It's deathbed repentance. My dad doesn't mean it. I know how he feels about God and the church. But God let him live long enough to convince Tom his dad was the real deal. And Tom and his family are here in church today. And their beautiful daughter, Michelle, we just baptized two weeks ago. We sing how great is our God. You have no idea how great our God is until you see people that have been lost in the darkness turn on the light. One more. Bert Holloway. Bert Holloway showed up here a few years ago one Sunday morning. He was a retired school teacher. How many of you here had Bert Holloway in, in high school? Yeah, 
So a lot of you here knew him as a teacher. Great educator. A brilliant man like, like Chick. Brilliant. You, you know. His wife, Donna, was so faithful, coming every Sunday. She begged him to come. He never would. I don't need it. Don't need it. He, did, he wasn't in the darkness. He had no eight-year-old pound gorilla. He had no problems. Very hardened to the church. She got him to come one Sunday. The Sunday he happened to show up. I didn't know, of course, he was going to be here. But my sermon was on the necessity of Christian baptism. And he told me going out, he said, how did you know my life story? I said, I don't know your life story. I don't know any of it, in fact. He said, I was sitting in the back. You got up and said, today I'm going to talk about Christian baptism. He said, I folded my arms and said, you'll never baptize me, preacher. I've got good reasons. He said, and you took reason number one, and scripturally, you just blew it away. I said, that's okay, I got four more. He said, you took the fourth one from scripture, and you just blew it away. And he said, you took the third one. And he began telling me some of these reasons he didn't need to be baptized. He said, you just blew it. He says, I want to be baptized. Here's a guy who's a retired school teacher, educator, that says, you know, the light of Christmas, of Jesus Christ coming to this world has pierced my darkness. And I, you talk about changing a life story. We got to see, like Lloyd, a changed life story. Bert became like Chick and like Lloyd. In fact, Chick and, and Bert were great friends. And they were at every Bible study they could attend. If we had one every day of the week, they were there. Every time church was, they, they were here. Their prayer was God would fill this church two, three services every weekend. And last week, going out, his son, Tim, said, Steve, you'll never, never truly know. Talk about how Jesus can radically change and rewrite a life story until you knew my dad the way I knew him before and afterwards. And this week, I was at lunch, took lunch to Sam at Sierra, and I uh, had to pay for it myself this time. <laughs> Didn't have the car ahead of me paying for it. But uh, we're eating lunch. My phone goes off, and it's an email from Tim. And Tim says, I'm not a good speaker, but I want to write your word of thanks for what you mean to our family. And I read and got choked up. And I shared it with Sam, and she started crying. She said, I've never heard anything so powerful in my life. It's what it's all about. Changing life stories. And I've been privileged to see God do that with people in their 70s and 80s so many times when it almost seems impossible that the light will never come on for these individuals. But we're going to wrap it up today by, we're going to play a video of two, it's not an Andy Griffith clip, okay? But next to Andy Griffith, next to Andy Griffith, these two guys, the skit guys, are going to talk about the importance of light piercing the darkness at Christmas. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Hey, honey, hey, which part of the church are you in the left or the right? Well, it's a candlelight service. I gotta know where you're at. Oh, ask her if my wife and kids are sitting there. Huh? You're, you're wearing red and green and you're holding a candle. Great, I'll be able to spot you out immediately. Ask her. Huh? Oh, oh is, is Tommy's wife and kids with you? Yeah, 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 there. Okay, all right, see you in a minute. Love you too, bye. Good. Are we late? Uh, we were 15 minutes late 10 minutes ago. What do you think? Uh, what I think is that Jesus is gonna like what I got him. What do you mean? Oh, it's his birthday. And? And I got him a present. A present? What present? We don't need to give them gifts. Really? You think we just show up, light a few sticks of wax, sing some songs, and call it good? Oh, the candlelight service isn't a birthday party. I mean, it's a time that we reflect on the birth of Christ. We light a candle as a message to the world that we believe that Christ will return one day. It's a light that dispels the darkness. We light a candle as a prayer that goes up to heaven that our hope burns bright. It's the true essence of Christmas. 
Did you rehearse that? No thanks. Did you hear what I said? We light the candle because- Yeah, yeah, I heard you. Well then grab a candle. I got my own. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesus. You're not gonna bring that in there. Sure I am. I want everyone to know that I'm thankful that he came and I'm looking forward to his return. That actually makes sense. Who's not playing with a full deck now? <laughs> Ow! The wax! I didn't think about the wax. It is so hot. I need something that I can... There we go. <sighs> That's better. Merry Christmas. Of course, that's a promo for our Christmas Eve service, but we want you to be inviting family and friends to come to our messages on Christmas for the whole month of December. We've only got a few Sundays left, well, the 10th, 17th, 24th, and we hope you'll come next week. Skyler's going to knock it out of the ballpark talking about the wise men, the light of Christmas, the star that led them to Jesus. Uh, later on, he's going to be talking about Zechariah and burning of the incense and the lighting of the candles and how the angel appeared with a message from God. We hope and pray, wherever you're at, that the light will be turned on this Christmas season for you. That maybe you're just bored, maybe you're on, running on empty, maybe you're like Chippy the Parakeet and you, you just feel like life's done a number on you and you, you've had it. I want you to see the light that, bright, that burns brightly, offering hope and light and life. Because there is no book of life apart from him who is the author of life, Jesus Christ. If you want your name taken out of the book of death into the book of life, only Jesus could do it. He's the resurrection, the life. And I pray he'll be your Lord and Savior. If you haven't made that decision, we hope you'll do it as we stand and sing our invitation.